Welcome back to the latest edition of Conference Chatter TV, where I'm here to reflect on a crazy 10th week in the Big 12. By far my worst week of the season. I went 2-4 and four and missed a whole lot of games this week, so let's reflect on some of them here in a second. Guys, I appreciate you checking out the latest episode. My name is Eric Sorrentino. I'm the KUSports.com Big 12 blogger, and we're still looking at a pretty decent record on the season, 60-19. and 19. Uh, accuracy rate of 75.9%, so that's not too bad. But the 10th week, I did horribly, quite honestly, 2-4. <laughs> and four. Let's get to some of those games I missed, because we have quite a few of them to get to this week. Starting with K-State 17 and Kansas 10. I should have picked the Cats, but it's obviously too late to go back and change my pick. The story in this one, guys, missed opportunities and turnovers for Kansas, and you saw that right off the bat. Daryl Stuckey took that opening kickoff 67 yards, and, you know, KU had great field position. What do they do? They miss a field goal right after that. Then you had quarterback Todd Reesing, who continued to struggle. Two fumbles and an interception. And, you know, whether the groin is, is hurting him or not, you know, those two fumbles, he has to learn to slide in those opportunities. You know, I've seen him slide a couple times this year, but it seems like, you know, in times that he doesn't, you got the guy, you know, the K-State defender coming from behind with that tomahawk chop to, you know, spring the ball free. And those two fumbles were costly for Kansas in that loss. You know, KU really struggled to move the ball down the field again. That's a couple of weeks in a row now. But I'd really like to give credit to Bill Snyder and K-State. I mean, KU, quite frankly, is, quite, is more talented at nearly every skill position minus running back on offense, and, you know, K-State still found a way to win, and, and really, they, they, they just didn't lose the game. No turnovers for K-State, <clears throat> three for KU, that was a huge difference. If you, if you don't think that Bill Snyder has had a major effect on the Sunflower Showdown, take a look at this year's game as compared to just, just last year, one year removed, when... Uh, Ron Prince was coaching K-State with really many of the same players that, were co that, that played in this year's game. I want to take a look at a few stats from, from last year's game and this year's game that really illustrates the effect that Snyder's had. K-State turnovers, this is just the KU game and K-State turnovers. Last year under Prince, they had five turnovers against KU. Under Bill Snyder this year, no turnovers. K-State rushing yards. Last year under Prince, 91 in the KU game. This year, 266 rushing yards. And Daniel Thomas, of course, went crazy for K-State. Um, you know, everything was pretty much better. KU rushing yards. Last year, the KU had 280 rushing yards against K-State. This year, they had 60. You know, the, I, I can go on and on. K-State penalties. Nine penalties for 98 yards last year. This year, only five penalties for 55 yards. You know, I've heard a lot of people say that K-State really did nothing to win this game and Kansas did everything to lose it. You know, look, KU, they certainly didn't help, you know, its own cause. But you know what? You know, Bill Snyder didn't help the cause either, and he deserves credit for that. You know, last year this was a K-State team that was undisciplined. This was a K-State team that guaranteed punt returns to the crib. And you know what? The guy that said that, Dion Murphy, is not even with the team anymore uh, with K-State this year. He's off the team. Bill Snyder's not going to stand for, for that undisciplined sort of behavior and those outlandish remarks that were made last year. You didn't hear him, obviously, this year. Um, you know, last year this was a K-State team that, that said they had more heart before the KU game. I mean, you, don't, you just don't hear that stuff under Bill Snyder. And K-State, quite honestly, they looked like idiots last year after all those remarks. You know, KU won 52-21, and you were just thinking, what is K-State saying? And this is only one year removed, and this is a considerably more disciplined team under Bill Snyder with a lot of the same personnel, and Bill Snyder deserves a lot of credit for that. He's, he's the reason that K-State is in first place in the Big 12 North right now. There's no question about it. So I missed that game. I picked KU in that one. I really thought that they were going to come back and, and win that one in Manhattan. That was not the case. Let's take a look at some others that I missed. Nebraska 10, Oklahoma 3. <laughs> I'll be the first to admit, I thought Oklahoma was going to win this big. I had them covering that six-point spread. Obviously did not happen. The difference in this game was that 
you know, Landry Jones threw five interceptions, but none were more costly than that one interception that Nebraska returned to the uh, Oklahoma one-yard line. And that was the only touchdown in the game. You know, Zach Lee with that one-yard touchdown pass. There's your difference. Um, the OU offense, they, they moved the ball a little bit, but, you know, they, but they turned the ball over on downs three times. They missed two field goals, and they had a separate field goal blocked. And, you know, that's, that's your ball game right there. Just a, a real defensive battle with two of the best defenses in the Big 12. Nebraska proving why it arguably could have the best defense in the Big 12. Just a great defensive performance. And now you look at the North standings with K-State 4-2, and two, Nebraska 3-2. and two. Could come down to that game November 21st, K-State at Nebraska for the Big 12 North title. Incredible that I'd, uh, you know, if you, you told me that at the beginning of the season, there's no way I would have believed it. But it's looking like that could be the case here. Great win by, by Nebraska. A really great win over Oklahoma. Next was, oh man, Baylor 40, Missouri 32. An awful, awful loss for the Tigers at home. Their chances of winning the Big 12 North are done after that game. It's just too much ground to make up after, you know, the, now they're 1-4 in the conference. How about Baylor freshman quarterback Nick Florence? A school record 427 yards passing, three touchdowns, a separate rushing touchdown as well. You know, there was absolutely no defense in this game in Columbia. 943 yards of total offense, no turnovers by either team. And where did this come from for Baylor? Baylor was a team averaging 8.5 points per game in conference play. Now they go <laughs> come and put up 40 inexplicably, uh, you know, in terms of the, the Missouri defense allowing 40 points to Baylor. This was out of nowhere. Now Missouri's lost three straight at home, and they're pretty much done in the north. Next game was Colorado 35, Texas A&M 34. This was another one I missed. How about Colorado coming out of nowhere? And, and honestly, I can't get Texas A&M. I, I just don't, I don't understand them. It seems like every week it's a different story. They're one of the most inconsistent teams in the Big 12. They can look really good at times and then, you know, other times just lose to Colorado. You know, Tyler Hansen for Colorado was sacked eight times, and the Buffaloes still won this game. How that happens, I really, really don't know. <laughs> Let's take a look at A&M's season here, just the roller coaster that they've had. They lose to K-State by 48. Then they win at Texas Tech by 22. Then they win at home uh, against Iowa State by 25. And now, of course, the Colorado loss. So it's just, it's been an up-and-down year for K-State, uh, excuse me, for Texas A&M. You know, they're 5-4 and four overall. Two and three in conference. They only have to win one more to get a bowl game, and I think they'll do that. They still have Baylor at home, and they should win that game to qualify for a bowl game. So I still see it happening, but it's just, you know, A&M's really about where they should be. Five and four, it's pretty much 500. They, they win some ones and, by, and look great doing it, and they lose some games and look pretty bad doing it as well. And Colorado, give them credit. They're... <laughs> I never thought I'd say this. They're now third in the Big 12 North with two conference victories, and they're three and six overall. I, you know, how, how can you explain that? I, I'm not even going to try to explain that one. Um, but Colorado, you know, they played well at home. They beat A&M, and, and they deserve credit for it. I, I didn't see it coming. <laughs> I did predict two games that were right, finally. Uh, Texas beat Central Florida. is about the easiest one to predict all year. The only one that you really, a couple of stats from this one, not to get into it too much, UT dominated this game, but Jordan Shipley, 11 receptions, 273 yards and a touchdown. And then Colt McCoy, 33 of 42, 470 yards passing, two touchdowns. You know, McCoy is back in the Heisman race right now. UT rolled in that one. That was, that was pretty easy <laughs> to predict. And then Oklahoma State, 34, Iowa State, 8. How about Keith Toaston? 206 yards rushing, three touchdowns, just torched that Cyclones defense. And Oklahoma State uh, bouncing back after looking really bad against Texas at home. So that'll do it, two and four. I'll try to do better next week. That was a pretty horrid week that I had in picking Big 12 games. But uh, we'll see how I do next week, guys. I appreciate you checking out the latest edition of Conference Chatter TV. As always, I'll be back next week to predict uh, games in week 11. Thanks, guys, and have a good one.